chapter 4 and verse 19. It reads, it says that we love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. Just turn to someone by you and say, I love Jesus. Because Jesus loved me first. Say it in a very nice way. Say, I love Jesus because Jesus loved me first. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I, I just needed you to stand up so that you'll be alert when it comes to receiving the word. We looked so dull. Hallelujah. I'll be sharing today on what I've captioned, the potency of God's love. The potency of God's love. The potency of God's love. As we've just read, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19 says that we love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. It means that, that our love for God is simply a reflection of his love for us. My love for God is just an expression of an existing love that God already has for me. So I can't really boast about my love for God. It's more of his love for me. The strength of my love for God is rooted in God's love for me. Someone say again, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. And that's it. My love for God is just a reflection of his love for me. Just like a child. The love of a child towards his parents is just a reflection of his parents' love already towards him. Every child, all things being equal, would love their parents. Would always want to be with their parents. There are some kids that come around their house and when they come um, and they get to play, they get to enjoy certain things that probably might not be available to them in their house. You keep them in the house for a while. Some of them can stay in the house for quite a while. But after a while, you still see they want to go back and greet their parents. It doesn't matter what you've given them to eat all this while. It doesn't matter the fun they've had. Something will still connect them back to their parents. You, service can close, and a young child can come and meet you and say, I want to join your car and go home. I, I don't want to go and pick a public transport. I want to join your car. You open the car for that child to join. And wait, 20 minutes into the journey, that child cannot see his father or mother by him. He will start crying. You can keep your air conditioning car. I want to go and join my parents. That's the love a child has for their parents. But that, that love is not automatic. It came first because the parents showed love to that child. So the child has identified the love the parents have. There are some people who, when they were born for various reasons, their original parents had to probably abandon them or died or something, and they never knew about it. So it was kept a secret for them that we adopted you. They never knew about it. And so these kids will grow for years thinking these other people are their original parents. Only probably to get to a certain age, and they are told that way too. Actually, this is the story behind your birth. We had to adopt you, you are abandoned. And then the real parents can now come into the picture, and you see that these people are not ready to identify with their real parents. Because it's a certain love they've noticed from when they were born. So a child's love, that's just the point I'm trying to establish. A child's love is simply because there's an existing love that comes from their parents. So don't just look at a child and say, ah, this child loves his mother so much. No, check first and look at the mother. You realize that the mother loves the child so much. So my love for God is simply an expression and a reflection of God's love for me. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. You might have to write a couple of the scriptures down because I might not be too patient because of the time limit. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. It says, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, history, 
But the greatest of these is charity. Said so there are three peculiar things. It says faith, hope, and charity. Now, the word used as charity, I'm reading from the King James Version, is from the root word agape, which means God's love. So it is faith, hope, and love. It says, but the greatest of these is love. Hope is very important. Hope is very crucial. In Job chapter 11 and verse 18, we see that through hope, we are secured. So hope gives people a reason to live for tomorrow. Hope is why a person would go through a tough situation and still decide, I will press on tomorrow. I will not give up. When people lose hope, suicidal tendency is coming because they can't see a way forward tomorrow. So hope is very crucial and hope is very important. And then we have faith. Faith too is crucial. Hebrews 11 tells us, verse 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is what gives substance to what we hope for. What we are believing for, faith is what makes us realize it is possible. So faith is so crucial. But the Bible says in all this, the greatest is love. Agape, God's love. The greatest of these three is God's love. Matthew chapter 17. Okay, let's go to Luke chapter 22 and verse 32. Luke 22 and verse 32. It says, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, Strengthen thy brethren. So this is Jesus talking to Peter. He says, I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Faith is so important. Jesus says, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Now, what this implies is that faith can fail. If Jesus says that I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail, it means that your faith can fail. So faith can fail. He says, but when you are strengthened, Strengthen thy brethren, which means it's not just Peter's faith that can fail. The faith of the other brethren too can fail. So faith can fail. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 8, it says, Charity, which is love, never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So we have just seen as important as faith is, it says that faith can fail. But it says there's something that never fails. It's called love. God's love never fails. Someone say God's love never fails. fails. Say it again. "God's God's love never fails. So it says that It says, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. So as good and important as prophecy is, it can fail. Prophecies can fail. The prophecies that we so desire and chase after, it can fail. It says, tongues shall cease. These are all powerful manifestations of the Holy Spirit, but yet it says, tongues shall cease. It says, knowledge shall vanish. My people perish for lack of knowledge. So knowledge is so important. But yet it says, knowledge shall vanish. There are certain things of God you know today. Tomorrow you realize that you needed to upgrade that knowledge. Paul, in all his dimensions that he will get in the knowledge of God, will come to a point, after all this, he says that I may know him. That I may know him. That I may know him. The disciples walked with Jesus, experienced certain aspects of Jesus. Yet they got to a certain point and Jesus asked them, who do men say I am? They knew that. Now, who do you say I am? They realized that the knowledge they had was so inadequate. Knowledge can vanish. It says, but love never fails. 
So if love never fails, why don't I depend more on the love of God that never fails, more than any other thing? If love will never fail me, why don't I depend more on that love, more than anything? As important as it is for me to grow in these other dimensions of God, why don't I focus and depend more on God's love? In Matthew chapter 17, and verse 14, Matthew 17, verse 14, we'll be reading down to verse 21. It says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and so vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and ye shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it? This kind goeth not but by prayer and fasting. So here's it. Jesus had empowered his disciples earlier on to go and cast out devils. Now these people brought their, their, a certain guy to the disciples to cast out the devil, and they could not do it. So they brought the, this, the sick guy to Jesus. And Jesus looked at it and he lamented. He said, you faithless and perverse generations, how long will I be with you? Now, Jesus was talking to his disciples. Faithless and perverse generation, that statement, Jesus was talking to his disciples. And Jesus is telling his disciples that have been with him all this while. He says, why are you faithless? Later, he tells them that if you have faith, even as a mustard seed, you can say unto this mountain, be removed and be cast into a yonder place. In other words, the disciples did not even exhibit faith like a mustard seed. So these disciples of Jesus were lacking in their faith. If you check scriptures, anywhere you see Jesus talk about great faith, he was not talking about his disciples. The two prominent ones, there was a centurion servant that came to meet Jesus. And he said that, my daughter is sick. So please, come and um, pray for her. Jesus said, I'm going to come and heal. He said, no, no, you don't need to come. Just speak the word. And Jesus marveled and said, what kind of faith is this? This is dimension of great faith. There was a certain woman, a woman from Canaan. She came to meet Jesus and she said, my daughter is sick. I need you to heal her. Jesus said, no, we don't cast the bread that is meant for the children and give it to dogs. The woman said, don't worry, the crumbs are enough. And Jesus said, what kind of faith is this? These were not Jesus' disciples. You won't find in scriptures anywhere where Jesus marveled at the faith of his disciples. Jesus oftentimes was shocked at the lack of faith his disciples exhibited. Jesus was with them on a boat, and then they were traveling, and then there was a storm, and they woke Jesus, and they said, don't you care that we perish? And when Jesus rebuked the storm and said, peace be still, he looked at them and said, how is it that you don't have faith? When Jesus was about to die, he had told his disciples, he says, I was going to rise up in three days. Immediately, Jesus died. They all went their various ways. When Jesus, on the third day, when Jesus resurrected, you couldn't find them there. If they had believed what Jesus said, that on the third day I will rise, early in the morning, this will have been by the tomb. They want to witness how he's going to rise up. But they're in their various places. 
When Jesus even met them, they all couldn't believe it. Not just Thomas. Thomas own was so nice, the way he said, until I feel it. Every single one of them, the disciples, doubted Jesus. Their faith was faulty, but their love for Jesus was intact. Remember, every time we talk about our love for Jesus, it's simply a reflection of his love. Their faith were failing, but their love was intact. It was the love of Jesus that kept them even when their faith failed. The one who dissociated himself from the love was the one who couldn't regain strength back. That was Judas. He took himself totally out. He went to betray. The moment he took himself out of that love, he missed out on it totally. The love of God never fails. When Jesus resurrected and he met Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes. He asked him again, Peter, do you love me more than all this? He said, yes. He asked him a third time, Peter, do you love me more than all this? Peter said, yes. Then he said, feed my sheep. What qualified Peter to be this great apostle was not the strength of his faith, but the strength of his love for God. Jesus did not say, Peter, where is your faith? Peter, do you have faith in me? Peter, do you have faith in me? Feed my sheep. No. Peter, do you love me? Even before Jesus would ascend, the disciples were still in expression of lack of faith. An angel would come and meet Peter and say, hey, go and um, minister to a certain guy. He has to explain to him, presenting to him in a vision, a table, and say, eat. Peter looks at this and says, no, I can't eat because it's unclean. The angel says, no, what I call clean, don't call unclean. So in the lives of the disciples, there were so many times when their faith failed, but love was what kept them intact. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It says, for by it, the elders obtained a good report. So faith is so crucial. Faith is so important. Verse 4, it says that Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. It establishes also that Enoch was translated. So all these are great manifestations by faith. We hear also that Noah built an ark for God by faith. Abraham's testimony by faith. Jacob by faith. Sarah by faith. So all these people exhibited great dimensions of God by faith. We are told in verse 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So notice, faith is so important because without it, you cannot please God. But verse 13, very crucial, don't miss this. It said that these all died in faith. All these great people we have seen, it said these all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You see, faith gave them good reports, but it didn't give them the promise. Faith gave them good reports, but it didn't give them the promise. It says they all died, not in unbelief. They all died in faith. They all died in faith, yet they did not receive the promise. Verse 32, it still talks about what some of the triumphs of these people. It says, And what shall I more say? For time will fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, and of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith 
subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weaknesses were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, tend to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings. Verse 37, they were stoned, they were sown asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. It says, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, notice, received not the promise. Amazing. It has just told us the various great things these people did. These testimonies, even today, are mind-blowing. The dead raised to life, shutting the mouth of lions, all these great dimensions of God were displayed. Yet, he said, they did not receive the promise. Yet, they exhibited great faith. He says, why? God having, verse 40, promised something better for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So, faith was able to make them obtain good reports, but not receive the promise. What is that promise? Jesus John 3 and verse 16 tells us something so important. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So how did the promise of the Father come? By his love. Not by our faith, by his love. There's a role faith plays in salvation. But that love of God was what brought forth the promise. And so in Abraham's time, Jesus was not manifested. Yet Abraham had great faith. Despite the wonders of Daniel and David, yet Jesus was not manifested in their time. It was not their faith. It was the love of God that brought forth this promise. So faith made them do amazing things. Faith made them do great things, but the greatest of all came by love. Amazing things were achieved by faith, but the most amazing came by love. If you want to do great things for God, you need faith. But if you want to experience the best of God, locate his love. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, but as it is written, I had not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. So there are things God has prepared simply for those who love him. For the people who love God, I had not even seen it, ye had not heard it. It has not even entered into the heart of a man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. So simply because I love God, there are things that are prepared for me. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Romans 8 and verse 28. It says that, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good to them that love God. It means that faith makes you work things. But love, God's love, makes things work for you. Faith makes you, gives you the ability to work things out. But God's love makes things work out for you. Through faith, these people did great things. But it says that there are things that work together for the good of them that love God. Faith is a currency in, in, in the realms of the spirit. We should know that. 
Faith is a currency. It means we need it to do things. Now, if you come for a service like this and you're hungry after, and you go to the shop, anti-patient shop, and you go and meet her and tell her that um, you're holding two CDs, and you go there to buy something, so you tell her, um, I want biscuits. And she gives you the biscuits. Then you look, you say, ah, and please, the fruit juice that is there, can I get a bottle as well? And then you now notice chocolates there as well. You say, ah, ah, this, is it Ghana chocolates? You say, yes, please, add it to it. Then you now notice both loads. There are some anointed both loads eaters here. You notice both loads there. You say, okay, add it to it. Then you realize all the combinations you have made. You need your mouth to smell all fine. Then you say, please, Tom Tom, just add the whole pack. And she packages it well for you. And as she's handing it over to you, you are giving her two Ghana cities. Now, she's a born again woman, but she'll chase you from her shop. You must, there's a certain value you must produce to match what you are demanding from her. So she would calculate and tell you how much it is. Probably it is 15 CDs. What you would produce to get that must be 15 CDs. That is faith. When you need certain things, your faith will determine what you can actualize. If your faith is low, there are things you can't do. But yet, she has two daughters, or three now. Whilst you are there struggling with your money on what to buy, they can rush to the shop and go and meet her and say, Mommy, Mommy, we want drink. We want juice. She can tell them, don't disturb me. Can't you say I'm busy? They will go back again. Mommy, Mommy, we want juice. She will pick the juice and she will give them biscuits without collecting money. What you would have to buy with money, they will get with love. There are things, if, if you want to come, we go to Elder Mate's place, and you want to sew a dress. You show, I, I, I want this latest dress. This is the latest, I, I saw it on a, a fashion magazine. So she'll take your measurements and everything, and when they finish, she'll tell you how much you would pay for it. But yet, her children can come and meet her. And before they will even ask, they are just coming to greet Everything is already set for them. What it will take faith to do, love can give to you freely. The King Christian was sharing a testimony earlier on. He said certain things were broken. And so he had to take his money to pay for it. And he realized it, he, had, he didn't have enough to finish paying. So here he is. He's believing God. He's building up his faith. So that God will intervene in a situation that involves a certain woman. That God will have mercy. So his faith needed to be built up for a certain situation. And yet, the brother is there. He's not building faith. He just goes to meet the woman and explains to the woman. And says, this is the challenge of what happened. Probably it was not his fault. It was not intentional. The woman says, okay. It is okay. He doesn't need to pay for it. What it would have taken him more to convince the woman... Love was able to sort it out. So faith is currency. There are things it will take us to do by faith. And it's important. But love would give us so much more. Some of us here go to work in offices. And if you are so diligent as Reconciliation Church members should be, in your workplace, at the end of the month, you are guaranteed salary. And if you work so well, you can be promoted and an increase in salary and an increase in position. So whilst you are getting money for your work done, there can be an irresponsible son that is just in the house, not as intelligent as you. He's just sitting in the house and growing pot belly. After all your years of service, they would give you some money. This guy with pot belly would inherit the whole business. Your work gave you something good, but his love connection gave him everything. You worked so hard, faith. You built yourself up, faith. And so it took you to a certain point. But this person who just had a love connection 
gave him all. If you want to experience all of God, get connected to the love of God. If you want to experience the best of God, stay connected to the love of God. The love of God is what releases the best of God to us. If you check your Bible and you study all the great men of faith that we even talked about, all through their lives, you will see that there was expression of doubt. Their faith filled them at various points in time. All the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, we can put Hebrews 11b and we also write all the places where their faith filled them. Abraham, God said, now nah, that's, that's the champion, the father of faith. The one we should look about is the champion. You, if you talk about your faith, it can't match Abraham's faith. God says, now nah, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to be father of many nations. This guy believed God. His faith was intact. His faith was intact. The wife said, yeah, go and sleep with the housemaid. This thing, I don't think it will work. Abraham just went. Faith, faith. The Bible talked about Sarah. Sarah did not just call Abraham to lose his faith. Her own too failed. God said, by this time next year, she started laughing. Gideon was talked about. Gideon went. His angel said, thou mighty man of valor. The man said, what are you talking about? Me? M mighty, mighty words. Where are the miracles of God? Every single one of them, their faith failed them at a point in time. David, everyone. So it was not really their faith that took them. It was the love God had for them. I have seen David, a man after my own heart. Abraham would go and he doesn't have the faith that God can preserve him before this king Abimelech. But yet the love of God is what to come and meet Abraham, having lost his faith, and still preserve him. If, if you speak to any great man of God that is honest, because you can have great men of God that are not honest. If you speak to any great man of God that is honest, he will tell you there are times when the mighty words God did through my life was not because I had faith. I heard Benny Hinn talk about a time when he was going through his divorce. And because of the experiences, he was not being so prayerful. Yet he goes to crusades and there were healings going on. But yet people did not know how he was struggling with his spiritual life. I heard Bishop Oedipu talk about when they were building Canaan land. He said they took the place to a very far place. And he was disappointed. Ah, we are looking for a facility to buy. And yet you have gone to the outskirts of the place. And they got there and just to thank God for their efforts. He said, now let's just thank God. In all things we give thanks. And as we were thanking God, God said, this is the place. That city that everybody is celebrating the great faith from the man of God actually was more of the love of God because he didn't locate that place purely by his faith. So in a service like this, desire that baptism of the love of God. 1 John 4 verse 16, as I get ready to end. 1 John 4, 16. If you want to get access to the mind of God, dwell on the love of God. 1 John 4, 16. If, if, if today you want to get information about the economy of the nation, the minister of finance is the best person to tell you about what to do in relation to the economy of the nation. But yet... If you go and meet the first lady whose responsibility has nothing to do with the finance of the nation and she tells you, come um, quickly, buy a lot of things because they're about to increase import tax. The price of fuel is about to go up. If she tells you that, quickly go and do that because what you will have gotten officially, she can get access to that information by love. First John 4 verse 16, it says, and we have known and believed the love that God had towards us. He says, God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. He said, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. He says, God is love. That is him. God is not faith. God is not power. 
God is not joy, but God is love. God is love. And he that liveth in love and dwelleth in love, dwelleth in God and God in him. And he says, this is our boldness in the day of judgment. That as he is, so are we. So what is our boldness in the day of judgment? That God loves us. It's not your works. No, 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 no. Some people told Jesus, see, we did this in your name. We did this in your name. We healed in your name. Jesus says, no, I, I, don't, I don't know you. I don't know you. Do you know what his testament was? He said, let me check your love game. He says, when I was sick, what did you do? So our boldness on the day of judgment is not that I built for God a mighty auditorium. No, 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 no. Not your works. Our boldness in the day of judgment is not the length of time we spent praying to God. No. It's that God is love. And if we live in love, God lives in us. And we also live in him. Can we rise up on our feet?